In March 2009, just a stone's throw from this high street, a murder took place that was to shock the nation and baffle the police. I'm dealing with a horrific murder here. I need the public's help to help me identify who the victim is. This was possibly the first case when I had really sat back and thought, this, this is disgusting. It's actually almost impossible to listen to. What followed was an investigation across two counties with more than 100 police officers involved. I've never come across a, an investigation as unique or as gruesome, really, as this. And as the investigation progressed, a team of scientists would make some startling discoveries about the nature of the crime. The fibers have actually got onto the tapes at the time he's wrapped the items. And what he's actually done is he's sealed the evidence in himself. Every murder is in some way horrific or traumatic. This one had a very different element to it. It's the calculating coldness of it, but it's the skill as well that is really quite chilling. This is the story of how police piece together evidence to solve the mystery of the jigsaw murder. Southgate, a suburban residential area on the outskirts of North London. It was here that Geoffrey Howe, a 49-year-old kitchen salesman, lived. Just behind these gates is the two-bedroom flat Geoffrey shared with a couple of tenants. His family described him as a jovial, charming character who had a heart of gold. But it was perhaps his good nature that would eventually lead to his demise. In early March 2009, he vanished from here without a trace. Geoffrey Howe was reported missing on the 16th of March by a friend. But it wasn't until a week later that a gruesome discovery 30 miles away set in motion one of the most grisly police investigations the nation has ever seen. Roger Kingsley is a farmer who's lived in the area all his life. He works on his family's farm. On the 22nd of March 2009, he was going about his daily routine. But with over 500 acres to cover, it's often several days between visits to any particular field. It was about half past seven in the morning when I started cultivating the field with the tractor. I noticed a bag at the bottom of the field. It stuck out, so it was quite noticeable. And I thought, well, I'll pick that up at some point in the day as it'll only get caught up when we're hedge cutting or trimming the banks and one thing or another. And I didn't think anything more of it until later on in the afternoon when I actually got a bit closer to it and I, I stopped the tractor, jumped off with the dogs to have a look. I found the object just the other side of this um, fence here. It, to me, had looked as though it had been placed, not thrown. It was in a, a green hold -all. And then when I unzipped it, the uh, object was wrapped in blue builder's plastic. And it was at that point I just touched it with my finger and it actually uh, squidged in, for want of a better word. And that's when I got a bit suspicious in the fact that um, it could be something that a bit untoward. Roger called the local police, who sent a team of officers to meet him at the field. When the police came out, I was here on the site to show them where the bag actually was. And the police officers approached it, um, looked at it. One of them bent down, undone the bag, and saw the blue plastic inside. And then he had a bit of a feel around inside and looked up to his colleague and said, I think it's got toes on. Well, that's pretty, I'm pretty sure that's what he said, and I'll never forget that. And they realized then that it was um, something very suspicious. Once they realised what was in the bag, they um, shut the road off, shut the village off, more or less, for that night and, and the next morning. Roger had found what turned out to be a human left leg, just close to a lay-by on the A507. But there was nothing else suspicious at the scene. The case was being handled by officers from the Bedfordshire and Hertfordshire Major Crime Unit, based here at police headquarters in Welling Garden City. But at first, 
They didn't know what they were dealing with. What was unusual about it was the, the scale in which the leg had been removed from the body. We had a specialist home office, a pathologist and an anthropologist to actually give us an informed view as to whether it was a medical amputation or not. But because there was no cauterisation of blood veins and arteries, then there was no, uh, no indication that it was a medical amputation. So we could rule that out. If we could rule that out, then quite clearly it was a murder inquiry. Operation Abnet was launched, but the key to finding the perpetrator would be identifying the victim. The vast majority of people who commit murder, murder somebody that they know. Um, that, that's a brutal fact of life, unfortunately. So if we could build up a really clear picture and identify who our victim was, that surely would give us a number of lines of inquiry to identify who the offenders were. But because the victim's details weren't on the DNA database, because they'd had no history of involvement with the police in any way, shape or form, it didn't help us in actually identifying who that one victim was. The police were making slow progress, but over the next few weeks, members of the public would make further discoveries that helped unravel the mystery, which was baffling both the investigating team and forensic experts, especially when a human head was discovered. It is a head with a face that has been removed. There are no eyes, there is no nose, there is no mouth, there is no tongue, there are no ears. It is an anatomical dissection, a fresh anatomical dissection. After the discovery of a human left leg in a lay-by in Cotterid, Hertfordshire, in March 2009, a murder investigation, Operation Abnet, was launched. With just one gruesome discovery made by a member of the public, police were baffled. It beggared belief to start with, to think, what is the behind this murder? What is the motive for this murder? And a week later, on March the 29th, there was a second discovery. A passerby found a left forearm discarded on a quiet country road in Wheat Hampstead. Almost 25 miles from the Cotterard site, the key question was, were the two body parts related? It's extremely rare for body parts to be distributed and then to be found in, in the, the way that it has in this case. Um, of course, a, a concern to me was, are we talking about one victim or are we talking about a number of victims? And it was only after the discovery of the body parts that we could then carry out forensic testing to compare uh, DNA between the body parts to confirm that we were, in fact, talking about one victim. The police began looking into missing persons records, but without being able to identify the age, ethnicity or even gender from the body parts, it was proving difficult. With no identity, there was no obvious motive, and the absence of even a murder scene left police with very little to go on. But while inquiries were taking place here in Hertfordshire, the case was about to open up on a much wider scale with a new discovery almost 100 miles north in Leicestershire. Well, what happened in this case was there had been two separate body parts found in Hertfordshire on, I think it was 22nd of March and 29th of March. On the 31st of March 2009, a Tuesday, um, there was the discovery of a human head in a field in Astorby near Melton Mowbray. Officers began a painstaking search of the area, looking for further evidence around where the head had been found. At the time of that being discovered, we didn't know whether that was linked to the Hertfordshire discoveries or not. So whilst we made initial contact with Hertfordshire, what we couldn't afford to do was to assume that this was the same victim, because it could have been more than one victim. As soon as the head was discovered up in Leicestershire, officers from Bedfordshire and Hertfordshire Major Crime Unit travelled to Leicestershire to determine then uh, who was going to be responsible for which part of the inquiry. The discovery of the head was on the Tuesday lunchtime. I had confirmation that there was a match to the Hertfordshire body parts um, on the Thursday lunchtime, so it took two days to actually confirm through DNA that it was the same victim. In any investigation like this, you've got one chance of getting it right. So you need to make sure that the processes and mechanisms that you're setting up are going to work, that you're not missing anything, that you're not duplicating effort. And it was getting that strategy, working with Leicestershire, that really put the investigation on sound footing. The head was found by a farmer who was digging in his field, and we believe the offenders had got out of the vehicle and discarded it in woodland that was next to the field. And we believe that it was probably carried into the field, into the open, by animals. 
The police had now got three body parts, all confirmed as the same victim through DNA testing, but they were still no closer to identifying a victim. And the state of the head, which had been found, didn't help them. Much of the skin and soft tissue had been removed, and police weren't even sure whether it belonged to a man or a woman. They called in the help of Sue Black and the forensic anthropology team at the University of Dundee's Centre for Anatomy and Human Identification. They sent a photograph of the head to us because they had another missing person, not in the vicinity, but geographically fairly close. And what they wanted to know is, could this be this individual? We're looking for a young adult female. Could this head belong to a young adult female? So we received the photographs, we looked at it and we went, no, this is not your young adult female. This is somebody else. This looks to us like a middle-aged male. The image is too horrific to broadcast. You could never have shown that image. And it's certainly not an image that I would ever show because it is, it is not a pleasant image. It is a head with a face that has been removed. There are no eyes, there is no nose, there is no mouth, there is no tongue, there are no ears. It is an anatomical dissection, a fresh anatomical dissection. That is not pleasant for anybody to have to deal with. But that unpleasant task fell to Sue and her colleague, Lucina Hackman. Our first thought when we looked at the head was that there was no soft tissue and there was no evidence of decomposition. So we had to look at another method of loss of soft tissue in this situation. So we asked ourselves if it may have been um, animals that had found the head and removed the soft tissue. But there were quite obviously no bite marks or any marks left by any animal activity. If this isn't animal activity, then it must be human intervention. If this is human intervention, then we predict we will find cut marks here, here and here. The soft tissue had been removed from the head using a sharp implement and it had been very skillfully cut with the muscles attached to the bone. That was a confirmation to us that we were really looking at a, a detailed, not just dismemberment but a disfigurement in relation to the head. Interestingly in this situation the teeth were all left intact which surprised us because the teeth are very commonly used as a method of identification. This is the CT scan of the skull, but even with the teeth intact, without any clue as to who the victim was, there were no dental records to compare them with, and the search for an identity continued. The police and forensics experts were working with what had been recovered so far. To date, only a left leg, left forearm and head had been unearthed. But a week later, two further body parts were found in quick succession. On the 7th of April, a right leg was discovered in Puckeridge in Hertfordshire. And just a few days later, a suitcase containing a torso was recovered three miles south. The new discoveries had the same DNA as the rest, and the torso provided police with some key evidence. We can now confirm the cause of death, which was a stab wound to the back. The man is to be believed to be of white, Asian or of mixed heritage between the heights of five foot six and five foot ten. Detective Superintendent Michael Hanlon decided to change tack using media exposure in the search for an identity which had been going on for close to a month. I'm, I'm dealing with a horrific murder here. I need the public's help to help me identify who the victim is. But it wasn't just the identity of the victim that the police were trying to establish. At a forensic science lab in Cambridgeshire, Ray Palmer was hoping to uncover more information about the murder itself and the culprits. The first task that we had in this investigation was to look at the debris which had been taken and recovered from all the deposition sites, from all the packages that had been used to wrap up the body parts, and to look at the debris to see if there was any associations which we could demonstrate between them that were common to them and may give some indication as to the last environment in which the deceased had been. Ray and the investigation team agreed a strategy that would involve analysing the tape that had been used to bind the sacking around the various body parts. The examination of the tapes consisted of us looking at these for what we call fibre collectives. Now collectives are actually populations of fibres which could have a common origin and appear to have come from the same source. So our first task was really to look at the adhesive side of the tapes to see if there were any fibre collectives present which might give us to some clues to the environment in which the body parts have been wrapped. 
The fibre evidence would only prove useful once the police had discovered who the victim was and where he was murdered. But as the forensics expert worked to find any evidence that would lead police to the victim, the police started to get a response to their media appeals. And it was one particular phone call that would be a key breakthrough. A member of Jeff's family, as a result of the media coverage, made direct contact with the incident room. Um, from the circumstances in which he had gone missing, that raised Jeffrey as a potential person that could have been the victim. I then sent officers round uh, to Jeff's home address. When they arrived, there was no sign of Jeffrey Howe. But there were two people living at the property, Jeffrey's tenants, Stephen Marshall, and his 20-year-old girlfriend, Sarah Bush. Jeffrey and Stephen had worked together at one point as partners in a kitchen fitting business. In November 2008, Stephen and Sarah had fallen on hard times, so Jeffrey let them stay in his spare room. They'd agreed to pay rent, but shortly afterwards they'd stopped making the payments and Jeffrey had asked them to leave. They refused to go. Officers of DSC and Sigri plus others attended the address in Southgate. Um, they spoke with Sarah Bush and Stephen Marshall, who were both there, and basically weren't happy with the account they'd given in relation to why Mr Howe wasn't at the, at the location. The reaction that Marshall and Bush gave when officers went around there was such that they were nervous, were being a little evasive. It caused concerns for the officers who then phoned up to say, well, OK, look, we're not happy with what we're being told. What do you want us to do? Sounds like a strange question, but a question where we don't know who the victim is at that stage. They made a cursory search of the address and secreted in one of the wardrobes was a number plate with the registration H8WEJ, which basically reads How J, which belonged to Jeffrey. And at that point, they obviously had quite um, huge concerns. Um, they made um, the decision to leave the address, regroup, and then the arrest was made um, quite soon after that. Stephen Marshall and Sarah Bush were taken to Hatfield Police Station for questioning. While they were in custody, forensics experts began to search for any evidence of murder in Geoffrey Howe's flat. But time was against them. If the police couldn't obtain significant evidence, the pair would have to be released after 24 hours. They're arrested for a murder that's happened but we don't actually know that that murder has happened. But that then starts the clock in terms of how long we can keep people in custody. We needed to work 100 miles an hour, literally, to get the evidence, because we hadn't gathered any evidence against them as individuals prior to their arrests. Initial looking at the flat didn't reveal that that was necessarily the murder scene, because quite clearly a really thorough clean-up operation had taken place. It was only when we managed to start moving furniture around, pulling carpets up, that the forensic examination revealed that there was a quantity of blood in both the bedroom and the bathroom. So we believe that he was stabbed in the bedroom and then the dismemberment took place in the bathroom. As officers worked around the clock at the crime scene, Detective Constable Sue Burns was preparing to interview Stephen Marshall. When I first met Marshall, he came across as a charming, nice person, if I'm honest. And he actually kept that up throughout the time in police custody. Do you deny or confirm that it's Geoffrey Howe? No comment. Do you recognise that person to be Geoffrey Howe? No comment. When he was being interviewed, he took up his right to make no comment during the interviews, which um, is obviously legally allowed to do. Are you surprised to learn that Geoffrey Howe's been murdered? No comment. How did you feel when you found that he'd been murdered? You think you're going to be dealing with someone that's kind of monster-like, and when you then get a man in front of you who isn't a monster, it's quite difficult to attribute what he's done um, or what's happened to this particular person. I believe he was a friend and an associate of yours. No comment. And my understanding is he's been quite kind to you in the past by allowing you to stay at his home address. No comment. Are you surprised that there's a no comments continued? You sit and think, well, if you haven't done this to your friend, who has? And if you haven't done this to your friend, why aren't you telling me you haven't done it? And as the interviews progressed, his guilt became more and more apparent. Do you feel upset by the fact that not only has he been murdered, but someone's chosen to dismember him and place parts of his body around the countryside? No comment. How does that make you feel? 
You got no comment to make about that, Emily, in any shape or form. No Bearing in mind, obviously, people will be listening to this tape, and he's a friend of yours, and most people, I would say, would be quite shocked by the fact that someone's been killed and dismembered. No comment. Throughout the whole of the interview, there was no remorse shown by Stephen Marshall. However, once the tape's finished, he was very courteous and very polite, and you know, and just seemed a just genuinely um, just normal person. Are you responsible for the killing? and the dismembering of your brain, Jeffrey Hill. Marshall and Bush were in custody, but at this stage, police hadn't been able to identify whether Jeffrey Howe was their victim or not. A thorough search of his flat had failed to provide any suitable items to take DNA from. And although Jeffrey had been flagged up by his brother to police as a missing person, he was adopted, so no DNA link could be established to his family. There were, however, other avenues to explore. We all have unique faces and unique skulls. So if we have enough information about the skull and the face, it's as characteristic as a fingerprint. Two people are still in police custody this evening in connection with the so-called jigsaw murder. The 37-year-old man and a woman aged 20 were arrested yesterday. Following the discovery of five body parts across Hertfordshire and Leicestershire in March and April 2009, police had arrested Stephen Marshall and his girlfriend, Sarah Bush, on suspicion of murder. Are you surprised that he's been murdered? No comment. What can you tell me in relation to his murder? No comment. Do you feel upset by his death? No comment. From the point of their arrest, Marshall made no comment to any questions put to him, so he, he didn't give us anything to work with. Bush gave an explanation, an explanation that was quite clearly uh, a web of lies. He seemed really lost. In what respect? Just didn't know what to do with himself. Just said, have you got that money for the rent? But neither admitted any involvement in the actual crimes. They were distancing themselves from the crime. The police still hadn't been able to identify a victim from the body parts, but they strongly suspected it was Geoffrey Howe, Marshall and Bush's landlord. He had been adopted as a child, so familial DNA links couldn't be established. In Dundee, forensic anthropologists were trying to help police confirm the victim's identity. In this particular case, we looked at craniofacial superimposition, which means that you superimpose um, the skull with an anti-mortem image, a, a living image of the individual who's thought to be the victim. So what we do is we try and match up the shape and proportions of the skull with the shape and proportions of the face to see if there are similarities or differences. Using a photo of Geoffrey Howe and a CT scan of the skull recovered in Leicestershire, Caroline Wilkinson was able to manipulate the two images to try to establish a match. First of all, if we look at the outline of the skull in relation to the outline of the face, you can see that the um, shape of the upper head, the curve of the head, matches up very well between the skull and the face. We can see the position of the orbits match up perfectly. If we look at the nasal aperture, which is the hole where the nose sits, you can see that the width and length of that matches up to the soft nose. If we look at the teeth, the position of the lower incisors match up to the incisors seen on the photograph and also the overall width of the chin and shape of the jawline matches quite clearly. The work in Dundee strongly suggested the skull belonged to Geoffrey. And once an odontologist matched the teeth with dental records, Geoffrey Howe was publicly identified as the victim on April the 23rd. The following day, Stephen Marshall and Sarah Bush were charged with murder and remanded in custody pending a trial date. But the investigation team's work did not stop there. It was now down to other forensic experts to come up with evidence that would prove crucial when the case came to court. At the Forensic Science Service, Ray Palmer was analysing evidence to try and prove that Marshall was present at the time the murder and dismemberment took place. He wanted to focus primarily on the tape used to bind the plastic around the body parts. This photograph here um, shows the duct tape which had been used to wrap the body parts inside a blue rubble sack. So our first priority was actually to remove the taping from the rubble sack in a manner which would allow us to recover and preserve any evidence which was on the adhesive side of the tape. In this particular instance, 
This kind of tape is used, which obviously, because it's been rolled up, is fibre-free. Because the tape's obviously been open at the time to wrap the body parts inside the rubble bags, this means that the adhesive is exposed to the environment in which it's opened. And in this case, fibres from Stephen Marshall's environment have actually got onto the tapes at the time he's wrapped the items. And what he's actually done is he's sealed the evidence in himself. The various samples were removed and mounted on acetate films similar to this one to preserve the evidence. The fibres were so tiny they were highlighted by red circles so the experts could examine them more easily. Now many people think of fibre evidence, they think of it in terms of threads and what we're actually talking about here is the individual components of threads. We're talking about sub-millimetre sized particles which are very often much thinner than human hair. Ray found fibre collectives that he believed came from a blue object with a peach skin texture. Forensic officers at the murder scene looked for an item that fitted that description. We could link fibres from the tape used to wrap up the body parts to inflatable airbeds that we know that they bought, Bush and Marshall had bought, after Jeff's death. Because after the death, they got rid of the bed because the bed, we believe, was quite heavily bloodstained. Bought some inflatable airbeds and fibres from those airbeds are identical to the fibres that we recovered off the tape that wrap up the body parts. This is a photograph of the, uh, one of the mattresses in question. And you can see it's, it's very much a typical sort of thing about a camping store. And it has a plastic inflatable sheath on which flock has been applied to the top surface. We removed fibres from the surface and placed them on a microscope slide. There are a number of comparative features we can look at. One of which is the actual cross-sectional shape of the fibre itself. Some fibres are irregularly shaped, some are very round, some are oval. In addition to cross-sectional shape, there's a, a chemical process involved in the manufacture of fibres called delustrant. That's a process which actually stops the fibre shining. So these are all features we can actually look at and compare directly against a, a suspect item. Having identified a match between the two samples, there was further compelling evidence to link Marshall to the murder scene. In addition to finding flock fibres, we found a number of green polyester fibres and green cotton fibres, which were subsequently found to match this green polo shirt, which belonged to Stephen Marshall. The evidence was overwhelming and placed Stephen Marshall at Geoffrey Howe's flat at the time the body was being dismembered and wrapped up. But while fibre evidence implicated Marshall as the murderer, back in Dundee, Sue Black and her colleague Lucina Hackman were making some startling discoveries about the body parts. Most dismemberments are unsuccessful or haphazard at best, because most individuals do not appreciate how difficult it is to separate the human body. If you think, right, I'm going to take a leg off, how do you do it? Well, you just cut across the thigh. And you might cut across the tissue, but once you get down to the bone, that bone's really tough. You can't cut through it with a kitchen knife. In most dismemberments, we expect to find those elements that show this person didn't know what they were doing. With the Jeffrey Howe case, we did not find that. So, for example, most of us in the public would find it very difficult to find where that junction is between the lower end of our radius and ulna and the start of our carpal bones, the radiocarpal joint at the wrist. Most of us would make several attempts and wouldn't get it right. And each one of those attempts would be recorded on the bone because you'd have that cut mark left. Marshall found it first time. The body was dismembered at the joints. There was no cutting of the bone. And that's what takes the time in a dismemberment, is cutting through bone. You need an implement that will actually saw through the very large bones of the lower limbs, for example, and the larger bone of the upper limb. In this case, because um, the individual went through the joint capsules, all it meant was cutting through soft tissue and cartilage and then separating the body at those spaces. So the dismemberment could have been done in a couple of hours easily by somebody who knew what they were doing. I've been an anatomist for oh, at least 25 years, I would say, and I've seen quite a number of dismemberment cases. I have never, ever seen anything at this level of skill that I think if I was given this task, if I had to do this, would I have done this any differently? And the answer is no, I wouldn't have done it any differently. He did it perfectly. And would I have done it any better? No, I couldn't have done it any better. 
So this is someone who, as an anatomist, I'm looking at an equal in terms of skill, and that's quite chilling. The forensic team's investigations had raised further questions for the police force. A line of inquiry was to try and establish whether or not Marshall had any uh, background in knowledge of anatomy, whether he'd previously been a, a butcher, a gamekeeper, something along those lines. But no evidential link was established there. This left no logical explanation as to how Marshall had acquired these skills and investigations into his past continued. On the 1st of May 2009, Marshall and Bush appeared in Stevenage Magistrates Court. They both entered a plea of not guilty and at the prosecution's request, it was January 2010 before the case went to trial. Right from the start of the trial, there were surprises, even before the jury had been sworn in. Marshall had originally pleaded not guilty to everything, um, but on the first day, he changed his plea and he admitted dismembering the body. What he didn't admit to was the murder. Stephen Marshall and Sarah Bush were being held pending trial for the murder and dismemberment of kitchen salesman Geoffrey Howe in March 2009. The pair had pleaded not guilty at an initial hearing and a prosecution case was being mounted against them. On January the 12th, 2010, the case was due to begin here at St Albans Crown Court. Just prior to the court case starting, uh, both Bush and Marshall needed to uh, present us with a defence case statement. During that defence case statement, Bush was claiming that Marshall had carried out the murder and Marshall was claiming that Bush had carried out the murder. It's what the prosecution called a cutthroat defence, where you have two people suspected of a crime and they both blame each other. So they're effectively pointing the finger of blame at the co-defendant and uh, their legal team will be um, adducing all evidence that they can that blames the co-defendant. So effectively they're, they're carrying out some of the role of the prosecution in a cutthroat defence because they're blaming each other and that evidence gets presented to the jury. This tactic was not seen as unusual, but there was one twist from the outset that was not expected. One of the few journalists who attended the entire court case was Rosa Silverman. Right from the start of the trial, there were surprises, even before the jury had been sworn in. Marshall had originally pleaded not guilty to everything, but on the first day, he changed his plea and he admitted dismembering the body. What he didn't admit to was the murder. Right from the start, we had a slightly bizarre situation where he had actually admitted cutting somebody up, but claimed that he was uh, not guilty of murder. And we all learnt of that before the jury had heard anything. And then there were three more weeks in which Marshall maintained that while he had cut up the body, he hadn't actually been guilty of the murder. He seemed pretty impassive. He, was, um, he looked resolute. He looked like he was concentrating very hard. He was taking it all in. He looked very serious but he didn't betray any emotion and he didn't look at Sarah Bush at all. The lack of a rapport between them in court, the lack of any kind of noticeable eye contact or exchange of smiles or exchange of any words or anything at all, suggests that relations between them had frozen somewhat since they were arrested and held in custody. As the case progressed, the prosecution witnesses painted a grim picture of Marshall's character. Marshall was known to us, he's got a history of, of violence, and again, that was evident in what the court heard throughout the time that the prosecution were presenting their case quite clearly. Uh, he has a propensity to violence. You know, we, we heard about different levels of violence that he'd used to a number of witnesses that gave evidence during the trial. So a very manipulative, dangerous individual who wouldn't bat an eyelid at turning to extreme violence. But some of the most compelling facts presented to the court focused on Marshall and Bush's actions after the murder, which had left a significant trail of evidence. The evidential links showed that both Bush and Marshall were plundering all of Howe's assets immediately after his death. Not particularly intelligent, because that was always going to lead the police back to them. And the abuse of Jeffrey's assets, stealing his money, began less than a day after he was murdered. On the 9th of March, Marshall sold Jeffrey's phone for £15 at this shop. The following day, Sarah Bush used the internet at St Albans Library to buy a mobile phone using Jeffrey's account.
clothes were purchased online using his name and bank details. And regular fast food and supermarket orders were made to various addresses connected to Bush and Marshall. And then the pair got greedier. They started writing checks to themselves from Jeffrey Howe's account, including one for £850 deposited in Bush's account on the 12th of March. A week later, Stephen Marshall was captured on CCTV, paying in a cheque for just under £100 from Jeffrey's account into his own. Then, on the 21st of March, Marshall sold Jeffrey Howe's car via an online auction. When they sold Jeff's car, they sold that to a non-suspecting member of the public. But on the receipt was both Marshall and Bush's fingerprints, which was key, obviously, from, from an evidential point of view, as we built the case around them. And before he sold the car, Marshall swapped the registration plates with his own ones. He was later spotted driving away from a petrol station without paying for the fuel in his car, now sporting Jeffrey's personalised number plates. About £5,000 is what Bush and Marshall had got away with, what they uh, managed to access from Jeff's sort of personal accounts and so on. Not a significant amount of money, and you, you, you know it's just very difficult to comprehend how anybody can give that level uh, of violence to carry out the murder and then the dismemberment afterwards. It's unbelievable. The court had been in session for three weeks, and the case for the prosecution was coming to a close. But before Marshall and Bush were called to the stand, there was another unexpected twist in proceedings. Other news now, and a man who's on trial for killing his colleague and then scattering his body parts across Hertfordshire and Leicestershire has pleaded guilty to murder. It's particularly uh, rare for anybody charged with murder to, to plead guilty because of the nature of the offence that they're charged with and the, the potential sentence that they're going to receive. Um, so it's very rare for anybody to plead guilty to start with, but to actually then start a trial and to change your plea halfway through the trial is even more rare certainly an experience that I've not had before. It was only at the end of the prosecution case that such was the wealth of the evidence that we presented that Marshall finally turned around and pleaded guilty. I think he had to change his plea. I think he had nowhere else to go. Um, the evidence against him was overwhelming. Um, the standard of the witnesses that gave evidence at court was um, outstanding also. And I think that he realised that the following day or later on that day he would be asked to account for his actions. And with Marshall's change of plea, the charge of murder against Sarah Bush was withdrawn. Bush pleaded not guilty to all the charges against her at the start, but then at the end when Marshall had pleaded guilty to murder, Bush then admitted uh, some lesser charges. She admitted helping to dispose of the body parts and giving the police false information about the whereabouts of a missing person. Having admitted to Geoffrey Howe's murder, Marshall then stunned the court further as he made an astonishing revelation. Stephen Marshall's secret past and involvement in gangland murders was revealed to the court today by his own defence barrister, who said that he'd learnt to cut up bodies because he'd done it before, not once, but four times. Apparently, he helped dispose of the victims of gangland executions while he worked as a nightclub doorman in the mid-90s. He came out with this shock confession, almost, which he really didn't have to do. I was just aghast by the fact that, in mitigation, um, generally people um, will say that they've had poor upbringings, um, there's been financial issues, things such as that, but to actually turn around and say in mitigation that um, they'd actually dismembered um, four other bodies was just... Well, I've never heard of that before, ever. I assumed we would be looking for somebody who had these skills in their normal, legitimate, professional requirements. Never as somebody, I, d I didn't even know that we had people who were experienced in this for this purposes. It's been a huge learning curve for me. When it turned out that his experience was actually in dismemberment for criminal purposes, that was totally unexpected. It fitted, but it was not something that we had expected to be the answer. With no need for Marshall and Bush to take the stand, sentencing swiftly followed. When the sentence was passed, Marshall still didn't really change his demeanour that much. He remained impassive. I would have thought he knew what was coming. Bush 
came across as pretty vulnerable. She didn't look as stony-faced as Marshall. She was quite hard to read, but she just seemed very young, perhaps slightly naive, out of her depth. Bush was sentenced for perverting the course of justice and got a sentence of three years and nine months. Marshall got a life sentence, which is a, a statutory sentence to be given in a murder investigation. Um, but he had a minimum term to serve of 36 years. And as far as the astonishing evidence Marshall gave in mitigation about his disposal of gangland murder victims' bodies, the Metropolitan Police tell us that no links have been found to any outstanding cases. I personally think that he's just pure evil, pure evil. We see bad people, we deal with bad people, and we're professional and we, we try not to take on board what they've done, but I think for Mr Marshall, he's just an evil man. He's got to serve at least 36 years before he's eligible to apply for parole. Now that means he's gonna be at least 74 before he's eligible to come out. So it's fair to say he will spend the vast majority of his adult life behind bars, which is where he deserves to be. Well, they've not met since the 2006 World Cup, but tomorrow night in a friendly at Wembley, they'll face each other. Again, that's England versus Sweden at 7.30. Next, though, we're off to the zoo.